It's not uncommon for many musicians to almost fall into collaborations and therefore bypass the formality of establishing how working together would feel good. We might even be made to feel like a buzzkill if we bring up the conversation. Are we officially collaborating with someone? And if so, how should that work? Both in the present and in the future, there can be a lot of pressure to just focus on the fun, creative stuff. Hello and welcome to Girls Twiddling Knobs. My name's Isabel and over the last decade, my self-produced and self-released music has amassed over 25 million Spotify streams. I also have a PhD in sonic arts, but I wasn't always this confident with music tech. In fact, I still hear those self-doubt gremlins in my head from time to time. I started this podcast to help more female identifying musicians start recording and producing their music and learn from other women making music with technology. If that's your cup of tea, then you're in the right place, my friend. Let's dive in. Welcome to another episode of Girls Twiddling Knobs, where we're jumping right into another deep dive episode. And this time, we're looking at how to establish respectful collaborations. And I'm curious, how easy do you find working with other people? Because while collaboration is a vital part of making music, it doesn't always feel easy or rewarding. Even worse, though, collaboration can sometimes even feel disrespectful. Sadly, especially if you're a woman in music. In fact, ask most women in music about their experiences of collaborating across their career. And amongst the positive working relationships they'll hopefully have had, there's often familiar experiences of not being listened to, not being taken seriously or even being ripped off or harassed in the workplace. This leaves many women totally at a loss as to how to progress in this industry and avoid being in these types of unpleasant interactions and experiences. Because whether you're in a band, have a team or you're a totally DIY solo musician, you'll likely need to work with other people from time to time to get your music out into the world. So inside this episode, I'm breaking down three steps you can take to ensure your collaborative relationships are respectful, rewarding and successful. Yes, it can be done, but it takes some getting clear on the three areas that I'll be walking you through in this episode. I'll also share a couple of my own experiences of disrespectful collaborations and how destructive these experiences have felt not only for my self-esteem, but also my enthusiasm for following a career in music. But over the years, I've also had some truly rewarding working relationships with people of all genders, and so I also know collaborating can feel great. There are ways you can set up collaborations to be respectful, and going through the three steps I'm outlining in this episode will also help you see the red flags a mile off when a collaborative relationship will likely be problematic down the line. And if you've ever felt pressured to start or keep working with someone that doesn't give you a good vibe because you worry otherwise you'll be missing out, I'll be sharing my take on this too. Ready? Okay, let's dive in. So let's just kick off by stating that what we mean by collaborating in a music context. And as this is Girls Twiddling Knobs, particularly in a music production or studio context. Swedish musician and artist Nicholas Mackelberg describes collaboration as a coordinated and synchronous activity that is the result of a continued attempt to construct and maintain a shared conception of a problem. In contrast, Mackelberg sees cooperation as an activity in which partners split the work, solve subtasks individually, and then assemble the partial results into the final output. But I would add that however accurate these definitions of collaboration and cooperation might be, in reality, many artists and producers call both these working relationships a collaboration. Whether we're producing an artist intensively in person in the studio from start to finish on an album or producing just one track remotely, this is still often called a collaboration. There is a final term, Mackelberg suggests, collective creation, and this can be thought of as a form of collaboration in which there is no conscious intent or explicitly stated agreement on either part to collaborate or cooperate. 
a great example of how collaborations or collective creation unknowingly happens in music technology today is with the use of downloaded sample packs or vocal top lines where the people involved typically never meet, talk to each other or are even aware of one another's existence. This has become increasingly more common since the dawn of the internet and if you're interested in hearing more about this way of working, take a listen to episode 17 of the podcast with Nita Saal, who makes sample packs, or episode 51 with Emily Nash, who used a downloaded vocal top line for her massively successful track, The Garden. Both those episodes are linked in the show notes. But collaboration can be a tricky business. For starters, humans are rarely predictable or consistent. We're complicated, can be really annoying and definitely not have our shit together on a day-to-day basis. Someone who seems like they'd be an amazing person to work with on paper can turn out to be a total nightmare over a series of days, weeks or months. Secondly, just like the other people we might collaborate with, we are imperfect as well. Sometimes it's not that the person we're working with is a total nightmare, but that when their stuff and our stuff collides, it's a nightmare for everyone involved. We always bring our past experiences, fears, insecurities, and expectations into our musical collaborations, and this is another reason why they can feel tricky to get right. But the creative nature of music can also make collaborating tricky. Sometimes we don't intend to start collaborating with someone But we're at a party, they pick up a guitar and we grab our laptop and we just start jamming. Maybe a few months down the line, we've written an album together and are about to release it into the world but haven't discussed or maybe even considered who owns the copyright or what role each person deserves credit for. It's not uncommon for many musicians to almost fall into collaborations and therefore bypass the formality of establishing how working together would feel good. We might even be made to feel like a buzzkill if we bring up the conversation. Are we officially collaborating with someone? And if so, how should that work? Both in the present and in the future, there can be a lot of pressure to just focus on the fun, creative stuff. And as well as these factors, collaborating can be tricky for women in music specifically because of our status in the industry. Still, many women are reliant on male gatekeepers to get their music recorded, released and taken seriously. Whether it be recording with a producer, recording on other artists' music in the studio, signing with a label or manager or getting booked for gigs and live tours, women still struggle to find opportunities in music that aren't largely created and provided for by men. In fact, according to the organisation UK Music, women comprise just 10% of the top 25 executives on Billboard's 2022 Music Industry Power List. And in a recent snapshot survey conducted by the Musicians' Union in June 2022, over 90% of respondents said they have experienced misogyny and or sexism whilst working in the music industry. Many of those experiences will have been in some collaborative context, whether it be fleeting or ongoing, with men in relative positions of power. If you'd like to dive deeper into the data this builds upon, I link to a lot of it in the show notes for the bonus episode I shared back in January the 29th titled Teaching Music Technology to Women Part 1, Why Have We Failed So Far? I've also linked to that episode in the show notes too. The disproportionate number of men in positions of power in the industry and the likelihood women face of experiencing harassment combined can make the idea of forging collaborative relationships in music feel precarious and even dangerous for many women. I myself have laid in bed turning over the prospect of a musical collaboration numerous times and not just the more common fears of will this person do my head in or am I taking on too much? It's also worries like will they expect me to sleep with them or will they try it on when we're alone together too that have kept me up at night? This adds significant anxiety and complexity to an already hugely difficult career path beyond just maintaining comfort and building success, but instead protecting your personal safety. And from the many, many women I've talked to over the past few years running the Female DIY Musician and hosting this podcast, music tech contexts seem to be some of the worst. Recording in a studio can be right up there with performing live when it comes to disrespectful interactions and harassment, but in some ways it's even more insidious because it goes on behind closed doors, often in windowless, soundproofed underground bunkers, to be precise. That's a studio, by the way. 
I have heard stories from my female contemporaries who have had their master tracks withheld from them because they didn't enter into a sexual relationship with the producer. Or women who have produced an album from start to finish, only to be denied the credit they deserved by the male studio owner where they recorded it. And others who have simply been totally ignored throughout the whole process of recording their album by the producer they're working with, even though they wrote the music they're all recording together. And while I myself haven't experienced some of the more disturbing studio stories that other women have shared with me, I do have my own stories of disrespectful musical collaborations. I'll share one of them here just for a real world example of when a collaborative relationship can gradually turn disrespectful. I'm not going to mention any names. This is just to contextualise what we've covered so far and why it's so important to have some tools in your toolbox to establish more respectful collaborations from the outset. So this experience happened a long time ago now. I think back in something like 2008. I was living in London at the time and a friend of mine had put me in touch with a producer who was looking for people to sing on some new tracks. I'd been told that this producer had been signed to Ninja Tune back in the day and that this new album he was working on might be released through them too. So naturally, this felt like an unmissable opportunity. It involved me travelling down to Devon, as that's where his studio was. And as I was staying with my good friend, that didn't feel too awkward or weird as a young female musician. But it turned out that the studio was in the middle of Dartmoor, with no other houses nearby. So when I got there, I realised it was going to be pretty remote. And as well as me and this producer, his co-writer, or maybe they were a sort of production duo, well, he was there also. And it started to become really apparent that the role they were keen for me to perform for them was that of the less experienced female just waiting to lap up all of their name dropping and industry anecdotes. There was genuinely very little interest in my background, experiences or interests at all. This definitely seemed to be partly about establishing a certain power dynamic where I was there to perform a task in service of their superior artistic vision. And although I had agreed to sing on their music, that was always the deal. I'd experienced other similar studio sessions where I had been treated much more like an individual with thoughts, ideas and experiences that had value. For example, I'd recently done some session singing in a studio in London with an absolutely lovely producer who had made me feel 100% comfortable at all times, had asked me questions about who I was and the music I made, and who didn't feel the need to assert some kind of dominance by proving how in with the music industry he was. So in this very remote studio in Devon, I could really feel the difference. But it wasn't until I was eventually in the vocal booth when things started to feel truly icky and quite disrespectful. I was in the dark, small vocal booth singing the vocal line they'd given me when they came through the talkback mic in my headphones. One of them asked me, can you sing it a bit more sexy? Immediately in my head, I thought, hmm, how the hell do I do that without sounding like some ridiculous parody of Jessica Rabbit? You see, the reality is, dear listener, I'm not a very sexy person, or I should say I've never been really able to perform sexiness on command. But in the moment, I just said, OK, I'll give it a try. I sang it again, in my mind, taking it to the absolute extreme of sexiness I could achieve or what wouldn't be utterly ridiculous. And once more, they asked me if I could sing it even sexier. I was cringing inside, but I did give it another go. This next time also wasn't hitting the right tone for them, though. And once again, I heard the voice in my headphones this time saying, Try singing it like you're a prostitute that's been out all night on the game. My immediate thought was, that really doesn't sound like a very sexy scenario to me. That's just making me ready for a 12-hour sleep after an emergency KFC. By this point, I just said, I don't think I'm going to give you what you're asking for. And we moved on to record the rest of the song. But it changed the tone immediately to me, feeling not just undervalued and disrespected, to being at risk with two guys I hardly knew in the middle of Dartmoor. There had never been any discussion of the fact that they were looking for a sexy sounding voice. Had there been, I'd have politely told them I probably wasn't the right singer for the job. And as this followed hours of listening to their name dropping and being largely ignored while they talked between themselves, this experience in the vocal booth made me feel so small, so humiliated and so disrespected. I left that session feeling disposable, powerless, 
and disheartened at the idea of pursuing music, not just because of that one experience, but because it epitomised numerous other micro-experiences that had come before it and some that would follow after too. Experiences like this left me asking, how will I be taken seriously as a woman in this industry? Will I only ever have a role as a disposable, one-dimensional, sexualized voice? Will the industry ever be interested in my ideas, thoughts and musical skill? If I produce, will I have to spend more time with people like that? Will people in those spaces presume I don't have anything to offer or anything of value? This is how destructive, disrespectful collaborations can be and how they often play out for women in music, especially in studios. So let's now look at what you can do to set yourself up for more respectful collaborations. Now, I first want to preface that sometimes collaborations change from something really rewarding, professional and supportive into being far more unpleasant. You may use all the techniques that I'm about to share and go into a collaboration really self-aware and transparent, only for it to become a relationship where you don't feel heard, respected or even safe down the line. In these instances, you and the techniques you've used to set yourself up for a healthy collaboration are not to blame. Like I said at the top of this podcast, we humans are messy, flawed and sometimes unpredictable. So I will be sharing some ideas for what to do when, despite your best efforts, a collaboration turns sour a little later on in this episode. But I just wanted to make it really clear first off that you cannot control how other people respond to your efforts to collaborate respectfully and you have to let them own that, not turn it back on yourself, dear listener. But these three steps to establishing more respectful music collaborations will transform not only how professional and enjoyable your working relationships are with other musicians, but also your self-esteem too, because it's all about boundaries, knob twiddlers, and valuing what you have to offer. So the first step is have a collaboration love and hate list. And this underpins everything, because if you don't know what you want and need from a collaborator, as well as what you really won't tolerate, how are you supposed to know how and with whom to collaborate? It's kind of mind blowing that even though we collaborate so much as musicians, we are rarely, if ever, encouraged to think about this. Instead, many of us just blindly wander into working relationships with other musicians and people in the industry in the hope it'll all just work out. But that won't be you any longer, dear listener, because for this first step, you're going to make your collaboration love and hate list. So all you need to do is get a piece of paper or open up a Google Doc and draw a square that has four smaller squares inside. This effectively means you have a big table on your page with two columns and two rows equally sized. Now label the top left square love, non-negotiable, and label the bottom left square love, negotiable. Next, label the top right square, hate, non-negotiable, and the bottom right square, hate, negotiable. Now, if you listen to the hugely popular episode number 56 on being assertive in music tech spaces back in season three, you'll remember me talking about negotiable and non-negotiable boundaries. This is similar, but it's specifically focused on collaborating with others. Once you've got your table all drawn out and labelled, you're of course going to fill it in. So either press pause as you're listening right now or set aside some time later to think about what your negotiable and non-negotiable collaboration love and hate list might be. I'll give you some examples to get you started. So inside your top left love non-negotiable square, you might add clear, transparent communication because you know this is key to having a healthy, long-term working relationship for you. But in contrast, in your bottom left love negotiable square, you might add fun because while fun is a great thing to share in a collaborative relationship, you may not feel it's a make or break for you. Next, here's an example for the hate squares. So in your top right hate non-negotiable square, you might add mansplaining because you know from past experiences that this just detracts too much from your energy and enjoyment of music. However, in your bottom right hate negotiable square, you might add lateness because while you don't like this trait in other people, it's something you can tolerate as long as your non-negotiables are met. Once you've completed your love-hate collaboration list, you'll now have a really solid idea of the types of collaborations you are looking for. This doesn't mean you're expecting to find the perfect collaborator every single time. You've identified where you're willing to compromise in your non-negotiables, remember. 
But it does mean that you'll be crystal clear on red flags as and when they appear because they'll specifically map onto your non-negotiable hate square. You'll also know when someone is a real keeper because they'll be ticking your non-negotiable love square. Now, it goes without saying that this list will change the more experience of collaboration you have under your belt. So don't see this as being set in stone. And it may be that after a bit of time, you don't need to have such a formal structure for thinking about your collaborative relationships. But even just going through this exercise will really help you feel more confident and clear about the types of collaborations you're looking for and when someone's definitely not ticking those boxes. Which brings us to step number two, your collaboration needs assessment. Now, this step comes into play when you're considering whether you should collaborate with someone. Perhaps another musician or producer has offered to work with you on a project. Or maybe you're thinking of approaching someone yourself. Going through the following questions or collaboration needs assessment will help you get clear on whether this collaboration is truly what you need. The reason this is important is because, number one, it can feel hard to turn down an opportunity as a musician, including the offer of a collaboration, but that doesn't mean we should take up every single one. And number two, in my experience, the vast majority of women in music underestimate their skills, expertise and ideas, and therefore end up collaborating with other people regardless of if they actually need to or even enjoy it. So here's three questions to ask yourself when you're next considering embarking on a new collaboration or even if you're currently in one but have a niggling feeling it's not working out. Now, as we go through these questions, I'll be using a scenario that probably resonates with many of this podcast's listeners. And that is a woman in music, let's call her Zoe, with an album's worth of songs ready to record who knows that getting them into release-ready tracks is her next step to growing her career. And while Zoe wouldn't call herself a producer just yet, she does have a super clear idea of how every track should come together and some basic recording gear too. I'm going to presume that Zoe is also unsigned and doesn't have a big budget, but she's just been approached by a producer she knows through a friend of a friend who saw her playing live and has offered to record her album for free. Should she take him up on this offer? It's a very generous one. Zoe might feel like she has to say yes because offers like that don't come around often. But let's take it through the collaboration needs assessment. So here's the first question. Do you genuinely need this collaboration? This is so key because unless the other person or people are genuinely offering something you can't provide yourself, it may not be worth the significant effort it takes to work with other people instead of just working by yourself. So in the scenario I outlined before, Zoe, who's been approached by a producer, would ask herself if she genuinely needs a producer to get her songs into tracks she can release. So many women believe this to be true unless they have a degree in audio engineering. But Zoe has a really clear idea of how she wants every single track to sound. For example, she knows she wants violin on four of the tracks, how much reverb her vocal should have, and she even has a couple of field recordings she's made on her phone that she can hear on the album too. In reality, Zoe is ready to, at the very least, co-produce this album. And while having access to a studio and a producer with a little more experience might be ideal... She could learn enough herself to get this album off the ground on her own too. Just to give a different perspective on this first question though, perhaps Zoe doesn't have any idea of how she wants her album to actually sound. Perhaps she just has the skeleton of the songs and desperately wants no needs to have the input of a producer to bring them to life in recordings. If that's the case, she may legitimately decide this collaboration is therefore definitely necessary. So the second question is just as important, though, and it is, would you rather do this yourself? Sometimes you might answer the first question with, oh, yes, I need someone to help me do the thing. But deep down, you know, you'd love to be able to do it yourself. And this could be for a few different reasons. Perhaps you've always been fascinated by that skill or medium, but just never had the chance to master it yourself. Or maybe now you're faced with needing to get a project off the ground. You've only just realised you could hypothetically take on a new skill or artistic medium and that really excites you. Or perhaps you know developing in this new skill or artistic medium would be really liberating and maybe even lucrative as a musician. 
These are also perfectly good reasons for why you might actually decide to invest in developing the skill set yourself instead of collaborating with someone else. So let's come back to our example of Zoe. Maybe she asks herself the second question of, would you rather do this yourself? And although she knows she hypothetically could produce this album herself, she really doesn't want to. She'd much rather give this over to someone else and just concentrate on performing the songs well in the recording studio. If that's the case, that's all good. But it's better that Zoe's intentionally made that decision rather than just wandering into a collaboration because it was offered to her. Alternatively, though, perhaps Zoe decides she definitely couldn't currently produce her album herself, but that in answer to this second question, deep down she'd love to be able to do so. In that case, it's clear that learning some fundamental skills in home recording and production is the best option for Zoe. And perhaps you're listening to this thinking, but that's how I feel, Isabel. I want to record and produce my music myself, but I have no experience, so won't it just be way easier and quicker to get a professional producer to do it for me? And I would say... Not necessarily, because while in theory working with a professional producer should speed things up, in my experience and the countless other women I've taught, unless you pay the going studio rate, it's going to take a long time because the person you're collaborating with will be doing you a favour. I've met musicians who have recorded their album with a producer for free or at a reduced rate, and it's taken them years with lots of chasing up to get it to the finish line. And I'm absolutely not saying this is necessarily because the producer was untrustworthy or wasn't totally well-intentioned. If I was producing someone's album for free, it would take me a long time too because I'd legitimately have to fit it around paid work. But my point is that often unless you're paying hundreds of pounds a day for studio time, it takes just as long, if not longer, to record your album with a producer who may or may not be hugely experienced as learning to record and produce yourself. And the last thing I'd say on this topic is that in reality, you only need to learn what you need to learn when it comes to recording and producing your music. By all means, you can keep building on your skills over time, but just learning enough to get your music into recordings you can release is enough at the beginning. But let's come back to Zoe weighing up the second question. Only she can answer if she would ideally want to produce her album herself. If she would, she needs to listen to that. Looking to other people to make it easier or quicker will only slow down her growth and development. And then here's our third and final question in our collaboration needs assessment. Does this person meet your needs as a collaborator? So for this final question, you'll need to refer back to your collaboration love-hate list and specifically look at the non-negotiables you've written down. This person or even group or organisation should meet those needs that you've identified. It may not always be possible to know at the beginning if they do, and I will share a thought on what to do if you realise later on that there's some red flags down the line. But you should still consider this right from the beginning, as it's important that your non-negotiable needs are being met and your boundaries are being respected. In the case of Zoe, perhaps she has mansplaining on her non-negotiable hates, and she notices that this producer keeps pointing out things she already knew about her music, almost as a compliment, but with no recognition that she had intentionally crafted these elements herself. For example, maybe he said, do you realise you've written this song in 5-4 before proceeding to explain why this time signature complements the instability of the song's lyrical content? And while some musicians may decide they really need a producer, don't want to learn to do it themselves, and therefore are happy to put up with a little mansplaining, for Zoe this is a big no-no. On the other hand... Perhaps Zoe has clear communication on her non-negotiable love list and she really appreciated that this producer not only asked if he could produce her album but also emailed her his availability for the next few weeks, a link to his past production work and said that he always likes to discuss terms up front even when he works with people for free. Bingo! In this scenario, Zoe might decide this was a great collaborator for her. And what about if Zoe has both mansplaining and clear communication as her non-negotiable love and hate, and this producer is displaying both? In this instance, Zoe would have to decide which was more important to her and listen to her gut. This is a great example of when having a few collaboration experiences under your belt can help because you have a first-hand appreciation of why you might make compromises from time to time. 
The objective here isn't to answer these three questions perfectly every time, but instead your collaboration needs assessment is about just giving yourself the opportunity to consider these three questions before embarking on a new collaboration or even continuing in an existing one. And just to recap over the three questions in this second step, they are, firstly, do you genuinely need this collaboration? Secondly, would you rather do this yourself? And thirdly, does this person meet your needs as a collaborator? Now, there will be times where things still don't go to plan, even after running through these three questions, and that's okay. Each time you learn more and more, but these questions give you clarity from the off and as you progress throughout your career. But presuming Zoe or you decides to collaborate with someone after considering the questions in this collaboration needs assessment, it's time to move on to step number three, which is outline the scope, roles and expectations. This is something you should do right at the beginning of a collaborative relationship and with whoever is involved. Many times that will be with one other person, as in the case of Zoe and the producer, but sometimes it's with a group or team of people. This conversation is so often kicked down the road because people find it awkward. But if you face it head on at the beginning, it means you can fully enjoy the creative stuff, knowing everyone's on the same page. So this third step is really about how to have this conversation as well as what to discuss. First, if you're the person who decides or is made to initiate this initial conversation, I recommend not framing it around the pretext that it's about any lack of trust on your part. So, for example, rather than saying, I'd really like to define the scope of this project because I don't want to be fucked around. Instead, Zoe could introduce the conversation more like this. It would be great to grab a coffee before our first studio session. When I've worked with people in the past, it's been really beneficial to have an initial conversation about the scope of the project, the roles we want to take and our expectations for the work too. It's a much more positive way of setting up this initial conversation whilst also being clear on why it's important to you. Once you've set this up, what should you talk about together? Well, I would suggest covering three main things. Scope, roles, expectations. So the scope is about the size and length and no sniggering in the back. How big is this project? Is it one song, one album, three albums? An indefinite partnership under a shared artist name? And how long are you going to be spending on it? One day a month? One day a week? A whole week in August? This can help you establish how much of your time you're able and willing to give. The next discussion point is roles. And while this starts as specifically what roles you're going to take, it should also then move into credits and royalties too. Yes, this is that moment where you're going to have that talk about money and it's only an initial discussion, so please don't freak out too much if this all feels a little bit scary to you. But in the case of our musician Zoe, perhaps she shares that while she doesn't have a great deal of production experience, she has a lot of ideas and would therefore like to co-produce the album. Perhaps the producer is happy with this arrangement, and so they decide to initially agree on a 50-50 split of the production royalties. Zoe also states how much those will be of the overall master royalties, in this case 3% according to the industry average for her musical genre. Zoe might acknowledge that this is just an agreement in principle and that there should be a follow-up discussion later down the line, as no music has actually been made yet. And lastly, there should be a conversation about each other's expectations for working together. This can be brought up relatively casually by asking the other person... Are there any pet peeves I should know about before we start working together? Or something you should know about me is that I can't stand it when people do X. Or I have dyslexia, so I might forget names and terminology from time to time, for example. Giving each other the chance to share their likes, dislikes and needs with regards to collaboration can be really helpful in not only in breaking the ice, but establishing trust and a healthy working dynamic. By the way, if the other person doesn't want to have this conversation or doesn't take it seriously, this should be a big red flag. Because musicians who intend and prefer working professionally and respectfully will likely be grateful for the opportunity to do so. By the by, if you yourself don't want to have this conversation or can't seem to take it seriously, that's a great sign that there's some growing and maturing to do as an artist for you, dear listener. This initial discussion of the scope, roles and expectations going into a collaborative relationship is really important and not worth putting off. 
So that's my three steps to establishing respectful music collaborations. And let's just run through them again, because we did go into a fair bit of detail there. So step one, write your collaboration love-hate list. Identify your needs and desires in a collaborative relationship and which of these are negotiable and which are non-negotiable. Step two, run through the three questions in the collaborative needs assessment to know if this specific collaboration is right for you. This can also be used for pre-existing collaborations too. And step three, outline the scope, roles and expectations. Get clear on exactly what you're committing to and what you both hope to get out of your time working together. Hopefully it's clear to see that if you go through these three steps, you'll be far more likely to either embark on a healthy collaboration or avoid a problematic one. But before we finish this episode up, we need to consider two final things. Firstly, what happens if you go through these three steps, but the collaboration turns sour nonetheless? And secondly, what should you do if a collaborator is sending out red flags all over the place, but they represent an opportunity too good to turn down? So first, let's tackle what to do if a collaboration turns sour, even though you've done everything in your power to establish a respectful relationship. And perhaps it's helpful to go back to my story that I shared of being asked to sing like a prostitute who's been out all night on the game. Now, there's absolutely no way I would have predicted that that was going to happen. If I had known it would, I wouldn't have agreed to the recording session. However, in hindsight, I can see there were some red flags along the way. The name dropping being one and the fact that both the producers who were in the studio with me didn't seem to take any interest in me as a person that day. But if I were to give the younger Isabel in that vocal booth some advice, I would tell her to be clearer about why that request was so impossible for her. I would tell her to state her boundaries, specifically that she did not sing like a prostitute who's been out on the game all night and that she couldn't even see why that was considered sexy anyway. Would they have said something like, all right, chill out, love? Yes, it's likely. Would I have probably never worked with them again? Yes. But in reality, nothing came from the project they'd tipped to be Ninja Tune's next hot release anyway, and I didn't want to repeat the experience all the same. Would I have walked away feeling like I'd maintained a little more of my integrity? Yes. Would it have been a great way for me to practice enforcing my boundaries? Absolutely. But more generally, I would simply say no matter what collaboration you're involved in, if it doesn't feel respectful, you are A, totally entitled to end that relationship, B, also entitled to clearly state why you're unhappy with the dynamic or what is being asked of you, and C, likely not going to get a satisfactory response from the other person, but that is about their stuff and won't detract from the self-worth and self-respect you will cultivate as a result of speaking your truth, as they say. Sometimes it may not feel safe to assert boundaries in this way, though. As we've discussed in this episode and many others, many women still face harassment and abuse in the music industry. If you're in that position, it's really important to reach out and ask for help and support. And if you're based in the UK, you can call the Musicians Union helpline on 0800 088 2045. That's 0800 088 2045. And I've left some more links in the show notes to more support of this kind. Lastly, I also want to flag that there may be times where you see the red flags clearly from the start. But someone is telling you that a potential collaboration will be a game changer for your career. Perhaps the producer says that if you work with them, they can introduce you to record labels or management. Maybe you're asked to teach production at a university where you're told you'll work alongside some of the best in the field. Or it could be that you're asked to deliver a track for a publishing company who claims they can get you synced on a big US TV show. But the non-negotiable hate box is being ticked left, right and centre. What do you do? Surely you just suck it up, right? Surely you don't turn down these types of opportunities. So to help in this scenario, it's worth remembering three things. Number one, it's easy to make big claims about the opportunities someone can give you, but they're rarely guaranteed. Just because big claims are being made, it doesn't mean there's any substance to them. And number two, it's actually pretty rare to come across an opportunity in music that genuinely changes everything on such a profound level that it's worth putting up with disrespectful assholes for. 
Sometimes there are events or relationships that do change the game for an artist, but more often than not, it's a series of events that gradually build upon one another. And number three, it's never worth compromising your safety, dignity or self-respect, no matter how much is being promised. There may be times where opportunities come along where you'll have to make some compromises you'd rather not make or some sacrifices, but it's worth asking yourself if you're still happy to make these if nothing comes of the collaboration after all. There's a big difference, for example, between making the sacrifice of moving to a new country for a great musical opportunity and putting up with someone inappropriately touching you in a recording studio. Will you be happy you gave collaborating with someone a go, even if it didn't feel ideal or even respectful, if your music career stays at the same level on the other side? Because no matter what's being promised, this is always a potential outcome. And that is our show, Knob Twiddlers. Phew, that was a real deep dive into collaboration, wasn't it? Like I said at the top of this episode, collaboration is an inevitable part of being a musician and this episode is absolutely not intended to put you off forging these potentially rewarding working relationships in your music. But the reality for many women in music is that making sure collaborations are respectful and rewarding can often feel complicated at best. So remember the three steps I shared to cultivating respectful collaborations. Number one, get clear on your negotiable and non-negotiable likes and dislikes when it comes to collaboration or your love-hate list. Number two, ask yourself if a prospective or current collaboration is genuinely what you need right now by going through the collaboration needs assessment. And number three, if you do decide to collaborate with someone, have that discussion about scope, roles and expectations of your relationship right from the start. Remember, if collaborations turn out to not feel respectful or even just not well aligned, you do not need to stay in them. The quality of your creative journey is worth far more than keeping other people happy or looking for the easiest route. Sometimes leaving these collaborations may require putting down boundaries and showing some assertiveness. And if you'd like some guidance on doing just that, listen to episode 56 of the podcast. Lastly, just because someone says they can catapult your music career if you collaborate with them doesn't mean they will. And it definitely doesn't mean you should compromise on your safety, dignity or self-respect. I would even go as far as to say it's a big red flag when someone claims the opportunity they're offering you is your big break. Music is a far more unpredictable and fickle industry than that. And if you have a friend or music colleague who you think would benefit from this discussion on cultivating respectful collaborations, make sure you share this episode with them. Now, on next week's episode, I'm joined by a guest that I'm pretty sure many Girls Twiddling Knobs listeners will have heard of. In fact, when I shared that she was coming on the podcast on our socials, lots of you seemed very excited indeed. I'll be joined by Irish musician Orla Gartland to talk about how she uses music production as a songwriting tool, when and why she wanted to learn more about music tech in general, and the London studio she's now set up and writing her second album from. But till then, take care and I'll catch you here soon. Girls Twiddling Knobs is hosted and produced by me, Isabel Anderson, with production support from Jade Bailey. The show notes are compiled by Francesca O'Connor, and this is a female DIY musician production. Just before you take out your earbuds and go off and do whatever it is you're going to do next, dear listener, Make sure you hit subscribe wherever you're listening to the podcast. I'd hate for you to miss any future episodes, especially any bonus ones we might release on the sly. Hit subscribe and thank me later. Right, I'll let you get on with your day now. Bye.